my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Cord Blood Registry. These days, feeling secure about your family's future health is pretty important. I'm very excited to introduce our new partnership with Cord Blood Registry, also known as CBR. CBR has helped millions of parents bank their children's newborn stem cells. Newborn stem cells have amazing potential for treatments in the future, and Cord Blood stem cells have already been used for 30 years in stem cell transplants. It's kind of like investing in your baby's future health. For a limited time, CBR is offering the birth hour listeners some pretty big discounts. Go to cordblood.com and use the code OUR. H-O-U-R, to get 60% off the newborn stem cell bundle, which includes both cord blood and tissue banking. Visit their website to learn more about how newborn stem cell preservation could protect your whole family and why CBR is the number one most recommended cord blood bank by families and OBGYNs. Visit cordblood.com and use code OUR for amazing savings just for our listeners. That's cordblood.com with the code OUR, H-O-U-R. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Shamanki, CBR's chief medical officer, all about the work they're doing. Okay, a couple of quick announcements. If you aren't already familiar with our Patreon membership, we would love to have you join us over there at patreon.com slash birth hour. We have a few different tiered options and Patreon is a platform where you can donate to creators that you love and in return you get awesome perks depending on which tier you pledge at. So head over to patreon.com slash birth hour to see all of the perks and fun things that come with that and we just appreciate every single person who supports us over there. The other thing I wanted to say is that our Know Your Options Childbirth course is still open for enrollment, and you can use the coupon code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment at thebirthhour.com slash course. All right, today's guest is Brittany, and she's going to be sharing with us her experience having an induction with Pitocin and doing that without an epidural. So let's hear from Brittany and all about her story. Hi, Brittany. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Bryn. It's such a pleasure. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah. So I live in Oakland, California with my partner, Mickey, and our five-month-old, Cassidy, and our fierce Chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Little Feminist. We're a monthly book club subscription, and we send one to two books a month to thousands of families around the country and world that feature strong female characters and black indigenous folks of color. It's so fun to have you on the podcast because we've partnered over the years as you started Little Feminist and now you're a mom. So I'm sure you have even more perspective on some of the people that you work with and the books that you're promoting and everything. I really do. Yeah, it's been, I was kind of faking it till I. No, (laughs) not at all. (laughs) All right. Well, let's hear your story. So let's start with um, getting pregnant and finding out you were pregnant. How'd that go for you? Good question. So my, let's see. So my partner has a spinal cord injury. He uses a wheelchair. So we knew I was actually working for babyless.com at the time, which is how I first got introduced to you and your podcast. And while I was at babylist, I turned to Mickey at one point and I said, Hey, I'd like to know sooner rather than later, like what are, like if we're going to need to do IVF or not, um, because with his type of spinal cord injury, it's, it's common. And so maybe five or six years ago, he got some extra testing for his part to kind of confirm like, yes, it was looking like IVF was going to be our path forward. So while it was disappointing news, it was nice to know, like we went straight, we did one round of IUI and that was not super useful. Um, and then we realized we kind of went straight to IVF and the silver lining in that is that we went straight there and there weren't, there weren't many months and years of trying. We went straight to IVF. And so we did, um, one round and have many embryo. I think we have, we had 11 total and, um, 
And then Cassidy was the first embryo that we put in, which took us both by surprise. Yeah. So what was it like finding out? Um, gosh, <laughs> I think we both, I mean, we just, I think both of our expectations were not to get our hopes up. And so mm-hmm. I think we, that, I remember that night it was around like Christmas time and we just got in the car and kind of went for a drive and kind of processed, mm-hmm. um, the fact that it, it worked as quickly as it did. And I think we were excited and I think we were also terrified. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you, like you mentioned, you kind of early on were already thinking about how to get pregnant and all these things. Had you thought much about pregnancy and how that would look for you, especially during your time at baby list? Yeah. So I knew that my first call, once we found out we were pregnant, was going to be to a, a old colleague of mine named Kalia. And she was a midwife. We worked at baby list at the same time. And I didn't know what our birth plan should be but I knew that in the Bay Area, we needed to like get into whatever birth plan we wanted. We need to we needed to find our care team sooner rather than later. And so we gave Kalia a call, and she recommended um, using a midwife who delivered at a hospital, and that felt like the best of both worlds for us. Um, and this is also pre-COVID, <laughs> and. Um, so we, so we were looking for midwives that deliver at our local hospital and there were five midwives that delivered at our local hospital too. We're not taking any new clients for our due date. And so, um, and then the other of the three left, two of them worked together. <laughs> and so it seemed like we got a two for one deal and found a great uh, midwife team to do, who delivered at, at our hospital. Okay. So you had it kind of planned out ahead of time. How did your pregnancy go? It was awesome. Yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need more I, of that. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, it was nothing, I mean, other, other than really annoying acid reflux, mm-hmm. it was really lovely. There were times where I felt like I was going to be pregnant forever. And so those days were harder, but I, I knew that <laughs> I wouldn't be pregnant forever mentally and um, just tried to soak it all in. And then So I think I was just had gone into my second trimester when COVID really hit the U.S. in a more public way. And so that also threw a big kind of wrench in in our plans. And there was a time where I kind of went back to Mickey and said, do you know, do we need to think about doing an at home birth rather than a hospital? I wasn't sure how impacted hospitals were going to be, if we'd be safer at home And, um, and so that was (laughs) kind of a whirlwind also, but a reminder that we never can plan for everything. (laughs) Yeah. I was just thinking of that with all the, you know, exposure you'd had to pregnancy and birth. And then here's something no one would have ever thought of that comes up. Yeah, exactly. There are no, there's no handbook. Mm -hmm. I knew all of my favorite like influencers and blogs and people to work with and talk to. And I really had like this insider I felt like I had all these amazing insiders to talk to about our pregnancy, but yeah, nobody knew, nobody knew anything about how one gave birth in a pandemic. Yeah. Well, is there anything else from pregnancy you want to share? Any other like birth prep you did, anything like that? Or do you want to go ahead and get into the birth story? I will share that we, we were on the fence about whether we were going to want a doula or not Mm -hmm. because we had two midwives and we were going, both of them were going to be in the hospital with us. And we also, this was a a time too, where doulas weren't even allowed into the hospital. So we were kind of on the fence and I'll say from my time at baby list, even with that time, I was very confused about what doulas did. (laughs) When I first heard about the job of a doula, I said, out loud, which is so embarrassing. Well, what, like I have my partner's going to be at the hospital. Why do I need a doula? And now on the other side of it, there's no way our birth would have happened the way it did without our doula. Um, so we made the decision with our midwives to look for a doula thinking that she would be able, she would help us at home for as long as possible until we transferred to the hospital because our midwives weren't really allowed to come and take care of us at home because of their contract with the hospital. So we did find an awesome doula and the plan was she would help us labor at home for as long, long as possible. And then when we go to the hospital, 
we'd have our midwife team there. That was the plan. <laughs> right. And then things changed with COVID, I imagine. Yeah. Um, well, so with COVID, they changed, but also, so my due date came and went, mm-hmm. and then more days came and went. And when I was 41 weeks, I started going in for um, non-stress tests. And so they wanted to actually start me on non-stress tests earlier at 38 weeks because um, I was an IVF pregnancy. And we kind of decided that if there's no reason to do extra testing, there's no reason to go to the hospital more than we needed to. So we kind of put off the extra non-stress tests until 41 weeks. And I went in for one non-stress test. It was, you know, they did a, a baby heart rate and then an amniotic fluid, uh, ultrasound. And so that first one went great. And then I went in for my second one a few days later. So I was like 41 and a half weeks and that one, our baby's heart rate looked great, but my amniotic fluid was low. And so I came home and about 30 minutes after I got home, we got a call from our midwives that said, because the amniotic fluid was low, we were going to need to start inducing labor. And so the plan with them originally on the phone was for us to, or for me, I guess my husband wasn't going to do this, ingest castor oil to kind of start getting labor going. And so that was the plan we had set with them on the phone. We started, uh, Mickey and I kind of started planning and talking. And then 20 minutes later, we got another call from our midwives where they said, never mind, the hospital wants you to come in now, right this minute. And so that was a big change and not that much time. And the reason was the, so the midwives have an attending doctor that, um, overlooks their own work. And it was our hospital's opinion that because I was post due date, I had, that was number one. Number two had low amniotic fluid. And number three was an IVF pregnancy that there was one too many, um, I don't know, strikes against us and the, and worry for a stillbirth. I think you talked about in previous podcasts, like there's some recent research about stillbirth increase, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, and I, and I get the rationale for them, but yes, we had to pack our bags for the hospital. And we had our hospital bag packed, but we had to pack our bags for a, you know, two to seven day induction process. And we, you know, we had packed our bags for two days, not seven. So that was kind of an interesting last minute packing effort. Yeah. I'm sure that was a whirlwind. Yeah, it was. And let's see. So we loaded up our car with absolutely everything that we could think of Um, because they did, they were allowing, the hospital was allowing partners to leave once a day to grab things. So we thought if Mickey could just come to the car (laughs) and get anything that we needed, that would work. So we put everything we could into the car. Um, we actually had rented a birth tub (laughs) to labor at home. So we (laughs) couldn't put that into the car. So that ended up staying at home and, this was this was just really disappointing news for both Mickey and I to have no laboring at home because I had kind of pictured how I would all the like coping mechanisms that I had learned, you know, I was picturing them in the comfort of our own home. And also it meant that our we weren't going to be able to use our doula. And so this was a really, I mean, it's an amazing collaboration between our midwives the hospital, our doula, and to be honest, two other midwives that we didn't even (laughs) employ all came together and um, asked the hospital to make an exception for us to have our doula come to the hospital with us. Their rationale being because Mickey uses a wheelchair that we were going to need an extra set of hands for, um, you know, for labor uh, and and they said yes, amazingly. And so right when we were heading to the hospital, we got news that Alta Bates, our local hospital, had said a one-time only <laughs> exception for us to have our doula come into the room. She had to get COVID tested and, you know, come to the door with those. And we were, she had, you know, she was going to come in right, you know, right when we needed her. Uh, so once labor got started. So that was 
while it was disappointing news and we felt kind of, you know, out of control with what was happening, it was really nice to know we would, we would have extra support. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad that they were able to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. It was a magical. Yeah. I feel really grateful to all the midwives, not even our own who helped um, advocate to the hospital that this was an exception to be made, which I feel so lucky about. Yeah. All right. So then how did labor progress for you? Good question. So (laughs) we got to the hospital and we decided that we do kind of a Hail Mary, like ask them to do one more amniotic fluid test because if it, we were only like, I think it was like 0.2 milliliters off, something like this. And so we got into the hospital, went into triage, got checked in. And so this was, a, this was August. Um, and it wasn't, it was very quiet actually um, in the hospital. And so we asked for an extra amniotic fluid test, which took a couple of hours. We were still low. Um, and then that meant we were going to try the bulb the cook what is it called the cooks um yeah i don't know that the, i know the foley bulb the foley bulb okay yeah that's right <laughs> you yeah. never know there could be a new bulb that i don't know about but. um so because of the extra testing we didn't put the foley bulb in i think it was three o'clock in the morning so we went in friday at 10 o'clock at night and then this was saturday at three o'clock in the morning um, our midwife was there to put the foley bulb in that was unpleasant actually <laughs> i wasn't expecting it to be as unpleasant as it was um, my legs started shaking. I threw a, I like lost everything that was in my stomach. And so when they asked me if I wanted a bit of morphine to go to sleep, I su- surprised myself and said, yes, please, which was a good move. Cause it really helps get a good night of sleep in that Saturday morning. So we're waiting for the bulb. It's inflated on both sides of the cervix to four centimeters. And so the goal is that the, those two kind of bulbs will force the cervix open and then kind of get labor started, um, on its own. And it was, I think maybe like two or 4 PM on Saturday that the bulb fell out, which meant that I was four centimeters dilated. And then we waited a few more hours, but I didn't have any contraction start. And so the next thing that we tried was mesoprostol. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think on, it must've been Saturday evening and at this point, my my poor partner was sleeping on the couch and this not, you know, the, and the couch is like perfectly, it's like just narrow enough that it's really uncomfortable to sleep on. And he had brought, this is one piece of advice too. He brought a sleeping, like a camping sleeping pad and a um, sleeping bag to the hospital. And so he did sleep slightly better than he would have, but you would think that the couches would be a little bit more comfortable for partners to sleep on. And so then miso was started Saturday night and that didn't get any contraction started. And I remember one of our two midwives meeting, uh, meeting us early on. No, I think we talked about it on Saturday night and talking about the next step being, um, Pitocin. So we talked about that on Saturday late and, And then I think at about 5 a.m. on Sunday morning, I remember the nurses coming in and saying they were getting us started on Pitocin. And I think I was kind of in and out of sleep at that point. And I, I, I just knew that was the way we were going forward. So we didn't make much fanfare of it. And so that was started at, yeah, about five in the morning, I think on Sunday. And then the second big bummer of our birth story is a few hours after they started me on Pitocin, you know, I woke up from contractions probably at about like eight in the morning. So a few hours later. So I did sleep (laughs) for a couple hours as they were just ramping up the Pitocin. And we found out when I woke up and that because they had started me on Pitocin that I had to be connected to the monitors from then until labor. And that was not super clear to me when we got started. I just wasn't aware that like I was imagining using like going in the bath for contractions or walking around and being more mobile. And it was just disappointing to learn that we were in, you know, I was, I was in a three foot radius of this pretty big (laughs) monitoring machine And 
I think I was most looking forward to, you know, using the bath and the shower to get through some contractions. And so this was a, it it was just a bummer to learn that after we had started Pitocin and we gave our doula a call at this time just to kind of talk everything through with her and asked her, well, what time should she come in? And her answer was, when Brittany can't talk through a contraction anymore. And right when that happened, I handed the phone (laughs) to Mickey because I couldn't talk through the contraction. So she, our doula arrived at the hospital about 30 minutes after that. So I think, I think this was around 10 AM on Sunday and contractions just started hard and fast. I, I don't know the exact timing of them, but it felt like you know, by 10 AM I was having contractions. It, it, it felt like every three minutes, three minutes, two to three (laughs) minutes apart, it could have been four to five, but they were real close. Um, I didn't have, I felt like I didn't have much time in between them to kind of recover. And remember when our doula got there and went through some contractions, maybe about an hour, I turned to her, her name is Sarah and Mickey and said, this isn't looking (laughs) good for me. I need a pep talk because right now I I can't think of doing this without an epidural. Um, I'm going to cry during this part. (laughs) And I remember Sarah, like putting her head down by me. I think I was squatting at this point and saying, um, I want you to know that this is the hardest part. And Um, you're doing really amazing and just know that this is the worst part. And I, we had, um, such a great relationship with her and so much trust in her from the, from the moment we like even our doula interview. And I like totally believed her that this was the worst part. And from that point forward, just like believed that like we were, I had hit the peak (laughs) and we were on, like, I was having a labor without an epidural. I was having a Pitocin labor without an epidural. It also helped (laughs) that I didn't, I wasn't fully aware that I didn't know much about Pitocin and I did not know that it made contractions, um, harder and, um, more intense. And I think that that (laughs) just thinking that, you know, that this, I just, I thought this was all normal and that I was, you know, doing it and going to make it work and we're going to make it through without an epidural. And I also didn't know at that point it was, my son wasn't born until four o'clock Monday morning. So there was a lot more labor that we had to do. Um, but when we asked our doula, so she, when we kind of had a debrief where we talked about the whole labor, um, a week after, or maybe five days after Cassidy was born, And afterwards, she had told us that when she sat down next to me and told me that this was the worst part, that it was her experience that it was because my brain was still online, that I was still like very much analyzing the pain I was in and where I was going. And my body like hadn't because the contractions were happening to me more than coming from me. And um and so with my brain still online and still analyzing everything that was happening, that it was the worst part. Um, and I think, you know, she made a, she made a good call on that point. Cause I think it was, I was thinking about how at that point in labor and not really, again, thinking about how in the world I was going to get through it. <laughs> um, and that became a lot less of an issue as, you know, as labor started. And my, um, my, uh, natural oxytocin never kicked in. So I was on Pitocin the entire labor and they had to keep on cranking it up as, you know, to, to get me further along. And I think by the end I was at like a Pitocin level of 23 and like 20 is their max. So you need like special approval from the doctor to go past 20. Oh, wow. Um, so it was a lot of Pitocin. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll mention is, I don't know at what point this was. I was, I was wanting to get into the, we, I think we had asked our doula if they, if there's any way we could like get into the shower or like bring the monitor with us into the bathroom to help deal with the contractions. And so they 
said that I could go. So I ended up going off Pitocin. I ended up disconnecting from the Pitocin. They said I was allowed 30 minutes to be off of it and go into the bathroom and be in the shower. I, I think I was still connected to the monitors at that point. And that was a nice respite um, that one of our midwives had like put little electric candles in the bathroom and like it smelled amazing. It was steamy and lovely and it was a nice break. And I noticed that my contractions and like pretty immediately like stopped once I was off the Pitocin. And so it would have been nice to have a 30 minute shower. And I think I was in there for about maybe 15 minutes and then we had to kind of work back up to where we were with the Pitocin. So it was, it, it was, it was definitely a nice break. Um, and you know, afterwards we had to work back up to where we were. And then at that point, once we got out of the bathroom, I asked, um, the nurse who had been with us, her name was Jackie to cover up the clock. I really was hoping that we were just a couple hours away and kind of knew internally that we were farther away than that point. And so I asked her to cover up the clock because I didn't want to be looking at the time. Um, and that was also a, a useful, I think that that helped a little bit too, to not be, I didn't know how long I was pushing for, for example, or how much longer we had to go. Yeah, that's a good um, tip. We talk about that in our yeah. childbirth course and I had kind of forgotten about it. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I'll also, the other thing I'll mention that was pretty awesome is, and we found this out afterwards, that our room uh, was kind of the talk of the floor for a couple of reasons. One, I hadn't asked for an epidural yet. <laughs> and two, there hadn't been a doula in the hospital <laughs> since March. And so one of the nurses, um, and her name's Jackie, wanted to be assigned to our room. And she loved natural birth and wanted to be, or, you know, vaginal birth and wanted to be there. And so we got this really out of, <laughs> out of this world nurse and our doula looked over her, at her at one point <laughs> and said, where did you come from? Um, cause she just, she was using the Roboso and she was, we were, we were all over the room together. She was helping with positions. And so, although we were, you know, tethered within a feet, three feet radius of this monitor, we did make good use of the rooms and many different positions, um, and dealing with, uh, every surge together. So that was, those are two other points to mention of our labor. Um, so I, I guess the, the next part is pushing. I felt the urge to poop for at many different points throughout the labor and thought that that meant we were getting close to labor. And I think our doula knew that it meant that, our baby was um, asynclitic, so his his head was tilted um, in a he wasn't kind of straight on to the birth canal. And so without she had she was kind of doing a couple different positions with us, and I didn't know at the time to kind of help his position, but it did mean that I was pushing, and again, it really helped to have the clock <laughs> covered. We I was pushing for for two and a half hours um, to and I think it was a little bit harder because his head, was to the side, um, you know, longer than it would be normal normally. And I remember getting them through, you know, under my tailbone, that was a big deal. And then I remember the ring of fire. So when his head was right at, um, the vaginal opening and I, remember thinking like, Oh, yep, this is why it's called the ring of fire. This is pretty bad. This is not fun. And I was, you know, just really over it <laughs> at that point. I think right before this point, our midwives had said, had encouraged me to start screaming, um, get out of my vagina really loud. So I was screaming this <laughs> for quite some time that's the first one for me that I've heard oh yeah yeah they that's just I mean so it was the first funny. thing they said like you should you know start you know start using your energy and start screaming like start screaming get out of my vagina and so I just started screaming <laughs> <laughs> what well, might have been for 30 minutes wow um, and oh. then right towards the end too I started cramping up um my different parts of my body like so at first it was my calf and then it was my thigh and everybody was really worried because I after I'd push I started shouting like, ow, 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 ow. And nobody knew what was, 
happening. And I had mm-hmm. to like say like, it, it's a cramp, <laughs> um, but it really, really hurts. And so, and every, it, and it happened, I think it was about four or five different times, like different parts. Like first it was my butt, then it was my calf, then it was my thigh. Oh. And so I just remember thinking like, I am over this. <laughs> We've got to stop. We've got to stop this if only because I'm dehydrated and exhausted. <laughs> So we made it to the ring of fire. And I remember our midwife, she, she said she was, she was one, one of our midwives was down below and one was right up at my head. And she said something like, you're so strong. You're almost there. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm going to end this right now. Like, this is, we're not going. Like, <laughs> so at that point, I remember thinking like every push, focusing on every push being my last push. And I think that that did cause, I think he flew out quicker than anybody was expecting. Um, I think right before this point, they were going to tell me to kind of start controlling my pushes a little bit more because it was close. And um, he flew out um, because I I was done. <laughs> and so I had a second degree tear, which at that point, I, I mean, I, I was just so relieved <laughs> that we had made it. And... Um, they put him on my lower belly and he was very slimy, which, um, now I know was he had meconium, uh, that, uh, was all over his body and had, um, was in his lungs. And so they kept him on my lower belly, um, for, it was just a couple of minutes and then had to move him over to, um, suck out what they could of the meconium. I remember I was every birth story Bryn, that I listen to or watch, I start crying. And so I assumed I would start crying at my own mm-hmm. and I did not at all. It was so far away. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember, I think the first thing I said to Cassidy was you're so big. And, uh, I just held them there until they took them over to kind of start sucking what they, the, the meconium that they could. My husband was over there with him. And so I think he was a little bit more alarmed by everything that that had happened. And, I was just so relieved to be through it. Um, they had kind of mentioned maybe needing to go to the NICU. Again, I was so relieved. It didn't, it didn't matter to me. And, um, they, uh, ended up bringing Cassidy and Mickey came back over to me. They're maybe over at like the table for infants. Um, I don't know how long it was. It was maybe like 10 or 15 minutes. And there was a lot of movement happening over there because, like, there was a problem with the monitor. And I'm not sure what was happening. But before they were going to take him to the NICU, our doula said, well, let's get let's get a picture of them as a family together. So they brought Cassidy over. And I, you know, put him on my chest. I'm going to get emotional this part, too. <laughs> and they still had him connected to the um, – it must have been the heart rate monitor – uh, yeah, they still had him connected to a heart rate monitor, but he was on me and Mickey and our doula snapped a few photos. And the, just the minute or so that he was on my chest, his heart rate um, stabilized. And I think it, they were measuring his heart rate and maybe oxygen levels. And they both stabilized um, so much so that they, the nurse came back and said, I'm not sure he needs to go to the NICU now because he's like even better than we would have expected. And so that was a really cool moment too, to, um, to, to, to get that kind of act. The skin to skin time was really for a photo (laughs) and it really ended up being a, um, it really, it it ended up saving us from the NICU, which was really amazing and a powerful example of like how, how important that like time with mom, um, Mm -hmm. and with a family is right after birth. Yeah. That's, that was really cool. That is really cool. Yeah. yeah I'm like you. I cry at every birth video, but I feel like <laughs> in the moment with my own births, I just, especially like we'll, we'll talk about maybe the placenta and stuff, but I always just felt like there was more work to be done. And I don't think I could really like let myself have that release until it was time to, you know, cuddle and. Yeah. That's such, that's such a good point. Yeah. You know, I'm crying. This is the first time I've cried telling my own yeah. birth story too. So <laughs> I, I had it in me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just to process it. Yeah. All right. So then how was your, your stay at the hospital and recovery and all that? Yeah. Um, so I remember, I just remember us moving like quickly, like not, I think we were out of our having, we were in that labor room for so long or, you know, you know, from Friday at 10 PM to 
Monday morning and, but then we moved out of there so quickly. So I think it was like, you know, 30 to 60 minutes we had packed up every, uh, you know, the, uh, and, uh, many, many bags that we had brought into that room, we packed up to be transferred. And, um, I remember being wheeled with Cassidy in my arms down the hall to the, to a different hospital room where we could kind of recover and feeling it just like, if it was, it was, if it was like an out of body experience at that point that like labor like was over, <laughs> that our birth was over. And I was holding this being that had been inside of my belly for, you know, nine plus months. Um, and I remember getting somebody, I think near the elevator said, congratulations. And it was so, so surreal I remember getting into our, our kind of hospital room and just falling like immediately asleep. <laughs> um, I think I had time to like put the blanket up to my neck and then just passed out. <laughs> Figured somebody else would take care of what needed to be taken care of. <laughs> That's so um, good that you're able to sleep though. Cause usually baby will sleep for several hours after birth too. I don't know how long it was. Yeah. I think, I mean, I remember waking up in the afternoon or early afternoon. So I think I slept from like five to, I think it was about five in the morning. So maybe like 12 or one. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I mean, the, the hospital was really lovely. I think that it was, it was sad not to have, you know, my mom or Mickey's mom or any of our family members or friends come and visit, but there was also something really like sweet and sacred about that time, just being the three of us um, together in that room and, you know, not having visitors. And so that was, you know, that was most definitely a silver lining. Um, Mickey went out to deliver the placenta uh, to my mom and his own mom. Um, I think it, it must have been at like four or five o'clock in the morning. They, my, my mom or Mickey's mom couldn't sleep. So they were up <laughs> and came up to the hospital to grab the placenta, um, to be encapsulated. And it was, it was just a, it was a really sweet time in the hospital together. I remember being kind of apprehensive to start breastfeeding. Um, cause I'd been with, um, my good friends in the hospital and knew how hard latching could be. And then I think one night a nurse just came in. It was like two in the morning. She's like, nope, we're just going to try. And she just like, she squeezed my boob and like <laughs> kind of rammed Cassidy's head into my boob. And I, one thing we learned from the nurses is how not delicate they are with <laughs> infants. And, and he latched and we like, we got it done. And it was an awesome lesson for me to learn, like, you know, how, <laughs> how, yeah, not delicate we can be with early breastfeeding. And and I remember when it was time to leave the hospital, both Mickey and I cried to le to leave because we had been there, you know, close to a week, and um, it felt like a safe little shelter. And to go out into the real world was a little scary um, and exciting, but but scary also. Yeah, I think that's pretty common too. Like, wait, it's been like a day. <laughs> you yeah. want us to go yeah. home and take care of this baby? Yeah. Um, so, how was your postpartum period at home? Yeah. It was, so the first week, um, the first two days were, were really awesome. Um, we had the help. So both my mom and Mickey's mom had kind of done a two week quarantine where they didn't see anybody so that they could help us. Um, and we could all be together in our house and oh, we live in a duplex. So my mom lives right upstairs from us. So, um, you know, it was nice to have everybody have their separate living quarters. Um, but then also have so much help in the beginning and so that was all really important. Like we actually got little naps, um, or times where we could nap and somebody else would kind of be listening for the baby, which was nice. Um, but I think it was the second week and I, or I think we just finished the first week and we're going into the second and it, the, like, you know, every hour and a half or hour to two hour wake ups were really getting to me and my body felt just like really, really wrecked. And, um, I think it was a combination of my body still recovering and little sleep, um, that I woke up. I think it was, a, I think it was just after Cassidy had been a week old and I felt really feverish. Um, and I felt 
flu-like symptoms. I called our doula. Then we were worried about me being exposed to COVID, which nobody wants to hear, (laughs) or just like worried that I could have COVID and maybe need to leave the house and go get a COVID test. And I couldn't even picture leaving the house. And because I was having fever symptoms, I, I stopped taking the encapsulated placenta pills. Um, and then I think I just had a really low, um, real low hormone hormonally. And so that was a really rough week. And I just remember, you know, crying uncontrollably and Mickey asking me like what he could do. And I just cry more because I didn't know what he could do. I just, there were, there were no answers. It was just, it was just more crying. And, um, so I just remember him kind of laying with me while I cried. And I think, in hindsight, it was just a, it was a huge hormone crash. Um, and I had my night, I had, um, some intense night sweats at this time too. And I think, I think another week in, um, my body started to feel a bit better and the fever symptoms started going away. So I started taking the placenta pills again and just felt a lot, a lot better. Um, but that was like the second week was really rough and, um, you know, similar to the beginning of labor, I remember thinking like women are absolute superheroes. (laughs) This is the most intense thing that anybody on this planet goes through. (laughs) And, you know, every mother has gone through it. And, you know, there, yeah, there were times right in the beginning of labor and also in that second week where I, I just didn't know how I was going to make it through and, Mm -hmm. and women are amazing. Um, (laughs) and we did so. Yeah, I was just every day. And I remember people telling us at that point, like, you know, I promise you it does get better. And I remember thinking, like, I I want you to tell me when it will get better. Mm -hmm. And that nobody has an answer for. But it's true. Like, it does it does get better. Um, And I think the third week, too, we did a better job making sure we were offering him naps. I think we were just all learning each other that second week. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was rough. It was really rough. (laughs) Yeah, I think it took me till my third to, like, realize that they cannot physically be awake for longer than like an hour without just losing it. And so if you could get ahead of that fussiness and get those naps in all the time, it's so helpful. That's exactly what happened to us. Yeah. I think we weren't really noticing. We were just like so elated and like, you know, FaceTiming with different family members and then be like, Oh wait, he didn't, you know, or he'd be kind of napping on my boob. So I wouldn't take, yeah. Right. Yeah. More diligent. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Did you have any resources? You mentioned a few throughout, but any more you want to add here at the end? Let's see. I mean, to know that you can demand a break from Pitocin. These aren't resources. These are just tips. tips yeah. um, <laughs> Words of wisdom. <laughs> yeah, you can, you know, you can demand a, de- uh, a break from Pitocin. Demand time, just, you know, even if it's for a photo um, before the NICU. Um, and what else would I say resource wise? Um, I would, you know, I did, I thought placenta encapsulation was a little strange (laughs) before deciding to do it, but I do, even if it was a placebo effect, like it did, it, you know, it did change my mood Mm -hmm. and I would still do it again, but midwives at the hospital felt like a really awesome combination of, of being able to, for, for, for us, we were more comfortable having birth in a hospital and it felt like to have a midwife team be, you know, we didn't really, we didn't see a doctor the whole time. So I really loved that combination of care and that, and for folks to know that that's an option, because at least here it's a little bit more uncommon. Mm -hmm. Um, people don't know that they can do that. So one last tip is, our doula came five days after birth, um, and came and sat with us and we debriefed our whole birth together. And that was actually a wonderfully healing experience. And even though our birth went like really wonderfully, I think there was still some, there was still some trauma about things going not as we, as we had planned or trying to different under, understand different points of the labor. And so she sat with us and talked for, I think it ended up being a couple hours just going through everything that had happened. And that was just, a, it was a wonderfully healing experience for both Mickey and I to understand everything that had happened. So, you know, a, a recommendation for folks to, to ask for that, um, extra time to process either, whether it's the doula or a therapist or any friend or family in your life, you know, birth was 
a lot. And even for somebody who had a, a great birth, like there is still, there's still trauma, um, a body trauma, if nothing else that, that happens. Yeah. yeah. That's such a good, good point to take the time to process what you've just gone through and it can often help to write it down or to talk to somebody like you did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for sharing those things. And then did you want to share where people can connect with you? Yeah. Um, let's see. I think <laughs> the best is probably my work email and then also, um, our work Instagram account, which I, I check more than my personal. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my name's, uh, Brittany, uh, and it's B R I T T A N Y at littlefeminist.com. And that's L I T T L E F E M I N I S T.com. Um, you could also just email hello at littlefeminist.com and say, you want to talk to me about birth, about that your email will make its way to me. And then Little Feminist Instagram account is uh, at Little Feminist Book Club. Um, and I check, I check our DMs there also. Okay, awesome. We'll put those links on the show notes page as well. Thank you so much for coming on today, Brittany. Such a pleasure, Bryn. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for letting me <laughs> process my birth with you again. Now I'm going to chat with Dr. Shamanki from Cord Blood Registry, today's sponsor. Hi, Dr. Shamanki. Thank you so much for coming on the birth hour today to chat with me about Cord Blood Registry. Hi, Bryn. It's so nice to be here. Can you tell my listeners just a little bit about who you are and your role at Cord Blood Registry? Sure. So I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Generate Life Sciences. And we're a company that offers a suite of services, actually, that's all designed to help grow and protect healthy families. One of our brands is CBR, and CBR is a newborn stem cell company, which is actually the largest cord blood bank in the world. That's so cool. I don't know a ton about cord blood registry, so I'm excited to just jump into, I think, some of the most commonly asked questions, and you seem like the perfect person to talk to about all of this. So (laughs) thank you again for joining me today. Let's start by just talking about what is cord blood and cord tissue. Sure. So when we say cord blood and cord tissue, we're referring, of course, to a baby's umbilical cord. And more specifically, the blood and the tissue that can be preserved from this cord after the baby's born. So that's because it turns out that the umbilical cord is actually an amazing source of two very specialized types of stem cells. And those are present in both the residual placental blood, that's the cord blood, and also the squishy soft tissue of the umbilical cord itself. We, of course, have lots of stem cells in our bodies, even our adult bodies, but doctors discovered a little over 30 years ago now that there's characteristics of the stem cells that are unique to the umbilical cord that can actually help save or significantly improve lives. So when you're banking cord blood and cord tissue, what is the goal and are you always banking both of those things together? No, you actually have a choice. Okay. You can bank both or you can bank one or the other. Um, They're a little bit different. So we always encourage people to bank both if they can. Um, The goal of banking cord blood and cord tissue is really all about capturing those stem cells, this one opportunity after your baby is born. Um, It's pretty simple. And what we want to do is preserve the newborn stem cells that are abundantly present in that umbilical cord It's really straightforward. Your doctor collects them after your baby's born, and then they get sent to a stem cell bank where they are frozen in case your family ever needs them in the future. Okay, so it sounds like stem cells are really important, but can you explain to us just a little bit more about the science behind them and how they're helping families in in layman's terms for us? Sure, yeah, and I could talk for hours about the science, but I'll I'll try to keep it simple. Um, the, The simplest way to break it down is there's really two major areas of science that use newborn stem cells for helping families. And I say families, it's not just kids anymore. Um, So one way is kind of the classic way that we discovered about 30 years ago. And that's where the stem cells are used for a bone marrow transplant. So CBR recently shared this amazing story on our blog about one of our families who used a big brother's cord blood for a stem cell transplant that treated his baby brother 
who was born with this immune disorder skid, which some people have heard of bubble boy disease. Um, so this little boy was born with bubble boy disease and he needed a transplant to save his life. And he was able to use his big brother's cord blood. And so that's, that's a pretty common way people think about cord blood. Um, and it's, it's interesting because actually when a child needs a life-saving transplant for cancer or an inherited condition like that bubble boy disease, siblings often make the best donors. There's a second way that stem cells are being used therapeutically, which is technically innumerable ways, but we catch them all under this phrase, regenerative medicine. And this is sort of the emerging, really exciting science in stem cell therapy. Most of the regenerative medicine clinical trials actually use a child's own stem cells to treat what's more of a degenerative condition like cerebral palsy. And that's really interesting because it appears that there is this population of cells that's unique to the umbilical cord that helps stimulate repair of damaged tissue. So that's, that's kind of the, the quick way to think about the science of newborn stem cells. Okay. And then why do you need to retrieve them, retrieve the stem cells at birth as opposed to later on in life? You know, it's a really good question. And it actually, um, it even stumps healthcare professionals sometimes. Mm. People say, why do I need to bank umbilical cord stem cells if adults have stem cells too? Why not just collect them later? Um, and as I mentioned, you know, adults do have a lot of stem cells in our bodies, but they are quite different from the kind in umbilical cord. So if you look at just those regenerative medicine uses, um, which is, again, it's really the interesting emerging area of science, the newborn stem cells demonstrate certain properties that actually can repair tissue better than if you use stem cells taken from adult bodies. So it's a little bit of a simplistic presentation, but it's always made sense to me, even before we had the science to prove it, that cells that are young and pristine would work better for regenerating damaged tissue than cells from, like, say, my middle-aged, tired mom body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then like you said, it's probably easier to have matches, especially when a situation comes up with siblings. So um, on that note, if you have more than one child, what are the benefits of preserving cord blood and tissue for each child versus just one? How does that work? Right. And this is also a real challenge for families. You know, I'm, I'm always cognizant that everybody, of course, wants the best for their children and raising kids can be very expensive. I've raised two, so I totally get it. Um, and it costs money, of course, for every unit that you preserve. So I always tell people they should preserve the cells if they can. But with that said, I would absolutely preserve cord blood and tissue for all of my children, given the opportunity. And the reason is because there's times it's best to use your own cells, and there's other times it may be best to use a closely related donor cells. So, you know, the, the example I gave of the transplant, that was best to use the sibling cells. Um, but we're seeing that with the regenerative medicine opportunities that can benefit so many family members well into adulthood, having the cells stored would be a real advantage if you, if you can manage to do that. Okay. And then as far as how this all works, can you tell us a little bit about the collection kit and how easy the process is? Yeah, for sure. I think the hardest thing for people is wrapping their heads around the science and what the heck does <laughs> all right. these words mean. The rest is really easy. Okay. Um, so you can, you can enroll online, you can enroll over the phone, and after you do so, you'd be sent a collection kit. It's actually a really nice self-contained little kit with everything your doctor needs to collect cord blood and cord tissue. All you have to do is remember to bring it with you um, on your way to the hospital and hand it to your doctor or your nurse or your midwife. Um, if you have, say, a midwife assisting with a home collection, you could do it there as well. And your, your healthcare provider will take it from there. So after your baby's born, they will know how to collect the stem cells. And then you would call the number on the instructions inside the kit and a courier would come pick it up from wherever you are and whisk it away to CBR's lab where we would process it and, uh, and put it in super cold storage for as long as you need it. 
Very cool. All right. And is that something you should talk to your care provider about beforehand just so everybody's prepared or is it super common and it won't be an issue at all? (laughs) Both. A lot of times people like to ask their care provider just to get a better handle on their recommendation. Um, but certainly even if you haven't given them the heads up, it's, it's pretty straightforward. There's instructions in the kit and for the most part, um, all of the different cordblood banks use a very similar looking kit. So once you open it up, the stuff inside is pretty common. So usually those healthcare providers know how to use it. Okay. Awesome. And then what would you say makes, um, CBR different from other companies? I know you said there's a few out there. Yeah. Well, for one thing, we're bigger. I mentioned we're the largest. Mm-hmm. Um, we have almost a million units in storage, Wow! <laughs> which means, I know, it's, it's really impressive to see the facility. Um, and, you know, that's not everything, but we've had to build pretty sophisticated systems to keep those stem cells safe at all times. So I tell people when you're shopping for a bank, of course, you really want to know as much as you can about where your child's cord blood is processed and stored since technically that's what you're really paying the company to do for you. Um, But I also think CBR stands out as a leader in research and development and science. We've always supported clinical trials and various scientific endeavors because we have this mission that we should continue to expand the ways newborn stem cells can be used to improve people's lives. We feel like we owe that to our customers to help expand all of the ways that you can use stem cells um, to treat your family. And then finally, because we're part of Generate Life Sciences, our clients have access to other innovative products and services and a really great team of people that are all part of the same mission. So one of those services, for example, is ReadyGen, which is an advanced genetic screening test for your newborn. And that's something that you can get through the same company when you enroll in cord blood and cord tissue. Very cool. Yeah, when we were talking before this recording, I just was so impressed with all the details about the company down to where you guys selected to um, have it located and the reasons behind that. I thought that was really neat. Right. I mean, it's, it's very inconvenient, for me, because I live in Los Angeles, <laughs> and having to get to Tucson is not easy. But for everybody else who's storing their stem cells, yeah, Tucson is uh, pretty much the only place that isn't uh, affected by any natural natural disasters. <laughs> right. So, yeah, Gotta it keep does them make safe. a lot of sense. That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for sharing so much about how it works and everything. And for those people who are listening and might still be on the fence about whether or not to cord bank, what would you say to them as far as just what you've seen from all the families that have benefited from cord blood and cord blood tissue banking over the years? Yeah. You know, I would say to them that of the many families who have used their cells from our bank, not a single one of them knew ahead of time that they would need the cells when they enrolled. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's people sometimes think about the likelihood of use and factor that into a cost benefit ratio, which of course we all have to do. But I would say to that two things. Number one, families whose children have used their bank stem cells are definitely not thinking about those numbers. They're thinking about the 100% likelihood in retrospect that their child needed this life-saving resource. Um, And then the other thing is that over 80% of the units we've released to date are for regenerative medicine purposes. So our field and our company being so devoted to increasing those use applications means that I can confidently say that the possibilities that families will benefit from storing your stem cells really only increases as we're seeing all of these new opportunities to improve lives with with the cells every day. All right. So where can people go to learn more about CBR and cord blood banking? Sure. So our website is cordblood.com. Pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And it's full of educational material. Um, You could probably get lost on the website, to be honest. So I particularly love the blog posts and some of the videos that are featuring families who've used their cord blood. You know, the kids are really cute and the stories are really inspiring. And I'm, I'm definitely a softie. The older my kids get, I think 
it's easier to move me to tears when I see videos oh, of yeah. little kids. But, <laughs> but, but, I, um, but I honestly think that's probably the best way to get a sense of who the people are that have used their stem cells and why they've stored. And I recommend everybody read those stories. They'll, they'll definitely warm your heart. Well, thank you so much for sharing today and for your time. I really appreciate you talking to us about this so that people can learn more. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much again to Brittany for sharing her birth story with us and to Dr. Shimaki for coming on and chatting with me about cord blood registry. Don't forget you can go to cordblood.com and use the coupon code OUR, H-O-U-R, to get 60% off the newborn stem bundle, which includes both cord blood and tissue banking. That's cordblood.com and the code OUR to get 60% off. If you want other information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Brittany's name in the search bar and her show notes will come right up for you. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.